There's really a wonderful revolution that's going on in psychiatric genomics um, that is laying a, a, a much more solid foundation uh, to the potential for developing therapies and understanding the disorder than I think we've ever had before. Um, when I was uh, asked to give the talk of the title, I was being a little bit lazy, and so I threw out a random networks and schizophrenia. But really what I want to talk about today is how we've been, for a number of years, using genomics to try and change our understanding of mental illness, and the talk will mostly focus on schizophrenia. So. Um, it's a cliche to say the brain is very complex. You know, there are 100 billion neurons. Um, they uh, are largely uh, born in fetal life, but of course they take the next 20 years or so to mature. And of course, I hope that they continue um, to whatever small extent we now know, you know, turning over and have some plasticity even into uh, 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 adulthood. Um, and this process, we know, um, is profoundly influenced by our genome. And if there was any need to know that, or, or any doubt about that, the experiments developing these beautiful little cerebral organoids, I think really, to me, demonstrated that one could start largely from you know, a simple pluripotent stem cell, and with, in some sense, trivial additions of time, growth factor, and, and sort of the right spinning, come up with something that was eerily reminiscent of a, you know, a proto-brain with ventri ventricle-like areas and cell types that um, were, were uh, quite, um, uh, had all the hallmarks of tr uh, traditional neuroprogenitors. Now, when this goes awry in a disorder, this process goes awry in a disorder like schizophrenia, it almost never does so. Um, and in fact, there's no example that I could quote for you where it's done so because of a mutation in a single gene or a very small number of genes. So the problem, of course, in studying this, um, among the many problems I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, is that the development of the brain is, of course, exquisite exquisitely synchronized. It's, you know, very symphonic. It takes place over space, time. It's very nonlinear, highly regulated. And so the question is, how are we going to integrate this with disease genetics, which we're learning more and more are uh, equally complex? So schizophrenia is a disorder of uh, uh, thinking and cognition. It's very common. It affects about 1% of the population. Um, and um, it is characterized by delusions and hallucinations um, that are required for the formal diagnosis as well as uh, a fair amount of cognitive difficulties, which are the kinds of difficulties that are more predictive of long-term dysfunction than the uh, positive symptoms, the delusions and the hallucinations. So um, there are still you know, a variety of major needs uh, in, in understanding schizophrenia. We really have very little understanding of how the genetic changes and the molecular changes are organized into pathways and circuitry, what signaling factors are affecting their activity, what are the pathways that are implicated. And, and not being able to answer these questions really limits our ability to move forward into improved treatment diagnostics and biomarkers. Um, a lot of this uh, is, is retarded in progress by some major impediments that we have to uh, deal with. There's never been a blood test or an imaging marker that is pathognomonic for, it's been shown to be pathognomonic or useful in schizophrenia. And I, it's unclear that that will change any time um, in the very near future. There are no animal models that model the disease in its complexity. There are models that have been used by, and developed, used very fruitfully in um, uh, pharmaceutical companies to be able to develop uh, uh, um, therapeutics that are similar to therapeutics that already existed, but there's nothing um, that really can capture the hallucinations and delusions and, and specifically the cognitive difficulties that we think are really hallmarks. Um, there are no new mechanism drugs that have been, um, uh, you know, come to market 
um, in the last 10 years or so that have any improved efficacy other than largely on side effect profile. Um, there are no large effect Mendelian type genes, so there's no family where there is a, a gene which has been shown to be necessary and sufficient. Um, and of course, human brain tissue is all but inaccessible. Um, there's also an enormous wealth of neurobiological data on rodents, but there's little functional data on, on human brain tissue. So this makes it seem hopeless, but it's really not hopeless at all. Um, it's a very difficult problem. It's an extremely important public health issue. I've just listed here some of the costs involved. Um, you know, what always is stunning to me is the percentage of permanently disabled uh, uh, people in the US that we know that the duration of untreated psychosis really, um, really has uh, a strong association with poor outcome, and that there's a very substantial reduction in lifespan, some of which is from the high rates of suicide, but not all of it. So the question is, why has it been so difficult to study um, this relatively common disorder? Part of it is that the mystery of schizophrenia is just this, that it's inherited, um, but also a common disorder. So the relative risk of developing schizophrenia in a first degree relative is about tenfold over the um, general population. And we know this from now almost 100 years of family studies, um, which have, have over and over, regardless of how you um, you know, the, the changes in sort of diagnostic schema over those times, been able to identify this increased familial risk. Um, the heritability is estimated at about 60 to 70 uh, percent. Um, and the, this would lead sensibly a scientist to think, well, um, it runs in families. Perhaps there are uh, Mendelian forms, single genes that we would be able to find. And so when the new technology in the 1980s was linkage analysis, it was applied immediately um, to uh, schizophrenia. And there were several very highly publicized and equally wrong um, reports of linkage. And that was followed by the next 10 or 15 years of arguing the field about did they have the right phenotype or not and collecting thousands of families. And I think we can say fairly clearly at this stage that it was uh, that there are no genes um, that um, have been identified because we were using the wrong technology for the problem. Um, at, uh, uh, linkage technology is extremely effective when one has a gene that accounts for disease in the majority of uh, patients that develop the disorder. Um, what if there are many diseases? What if they only increase your risk 5% or 10%? Under those circumstances, it's very difficult for linkage analysis to find um, the disorder. Now, I'm going to, on the next slide, take you forward about in about 15 years worth of genetics, which if this were a longer talk, I, I would tell you some of that. I'm just going to summarize it. And the, the main feature of all the data on that slide is that there are many, many genes of many types, uh, many types of, of DNA variants that are uh, in part um, uh, uh, responsible for schizophrenia risk. So there's a, uh, a large number of genome-wide association studies have been done um, there. The most recent one, which was published last year, found 108 genome-wide significant loci for schizophrenia. But of course, no single gene um, was implicated because of the uh, linkage disequilibrium. Many genes are implicated, and part of the, the later aspects of the talk, I'll describe our strategies for trying to identify which might be the most likely causal genes. Um, copy number variants have a small uh, increased rate over uh, the general population. Um, there are a, a handful of large copy number, vari copy number variants, like uh, on 22Q, VCFS, uh, in the VCFS region that are pleiotropic for multiple um, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, include, uh, particularly uh, overlapping with autism. And they, the, the genes that fall in these um, CNVs tend to implicate synaptic genes as a class, but not individual synaptic genes. Um, 
We've done a number of studies, and, and there's, there are others who've, who've recently published studies of rare variants from exome sequencing. Again, what we found was that it was impossible to implicate any single gene. So there's no burden of rare disruptive variants that are found in a particular gene. But if we look at the rarest class, we find that they are enriched in patients with schizophrenia. Um, similarly with de novo variants, and here the story is a little bit different than the story in autism where it's much clearer that there's an increased risk in the mutation rate. There might be a slight increased risk, but it's, it's, it's really pretty subtle. Um, there is again a fair uh, overlap with genes that are seen in autism, and we rarely in the uh, in the uh, trio sequencing studies see a single gene that's hit more than once with a de novo uh, disruptive mutation. So if we put all this together, and this is a, a, an oversimplification, but to me the model looks much more like one of overlapping risks and, and where you are and what you inherit in terms of uh, common variants that are each producing a small risk from the individual variants, but of course across our population, um, are accounting for a fair amount of disease liability and, where, and, and the number of rare variants, either uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or, uh, uh, excuse me, single nucleotide variants, or copy number variants, um, it will push you further uh, towards more severe disorders like, like autism and, and intellectual disability. That may, of course, will, that will also be um, in part influenced by uh, environmental factors and a whole host of things that we don't understand yet. So the question becomes which genes are relevant to go after for disease treatment um, and, and to understand the pathophysiology. So from the, the GWAS studies, we know that many of these risk variants lie in intragenic uh, intergenic regions and very far away from genes. They may or may not um, implicate specific coding regions. Um, and we also know that the associated regions, so this is a, a, a typical regional plot and all those elevated um, uh, diamond, blue diamonds are in linkage disequilibrium and while um, there's a, you know, a clear, very strong signal. We can't tell where exactly it is in that region. So it's been extremely difficult for these genome-wide si studies to nominate single genes. Um, so as we were thinking about how to go about moving uh, t into a more functional analysis of, uh, of risk loci, we of course knew, um, as did others, that there was a, a genome-wide enrichment of risk variants in functional elements of the genome. And, and this is just one um, example that I'm, I'm showing here where both uh, um, SNPs that were controlling the expression of genes, so EQTLs, as well as SNPs that fell in cis regulatory elements like promoters, um, enhancers, uh, 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 DNA hypersensitivity sites, or marking open chromatin. Um, or even more so, those that were expression QTL, uh, EQTLs that fell also in a cis regulatory element were all um, in, oops, enriched in uh, these uh, particular functional elements of the genome. So um, now, then the the wh what. Um, what the next step was, was to think about how in the world we were going to collect the kind of data that we would need um, to begin to put together enough functional resources. Um, and so this, I actually just pulled this from a, a recent grant. I'm sure many of you have, have similar integrative slides. I, I, you know, I adjust this for uh, whatever the sort of the particular um, uh, study that needs to be done, but of course what we really want to do is have a wide variety of functional data to be able to narrow down um, and to, to be able to narrow down our candidates into a set that both on, um, on genetic and biological terms makes sense as, uh, as um, mediating this risk of schizophrenia. So. Um, we knew that what was largely missing for us were resources around uh, the human brain. And so we established a few years ago the Common Mind Consortium 
bringing together brain banks that had never worked together, putting together about 700 samples in our first phase um, with a, a newer replication and extension phase of about 500 samples. This is sort of a typical brain bank population. Some um, mostly older people, some are, are from um, medical examiner cases. Um, but what this allowed us to do was to begin to make these kinds of really um, extensive molecular maps of the brain where we're now collecting a wide diversity of data. I'll tell you about some of our RNA sequencing results throughout the, the rest of the talk, but this is a, a public private this is a public private consortium um, in which we are uh, making the data available um, as rapidly as we possibly can through Sage Bionetworks here just a, a, across the street. Um, and we are uh, collecting gene expression information. We have already the genetic information. We're looking extensively in the same brain samples at Mosaicism. After we started the project, the NIMH funded a, a, a project that they're calling Psych ENCODE, which um, is collecting a great deal of information on histone modification and 3D chromatin structure. Um, and that data also will be released in the, in the same way, and we're just embarking on some proteomics. So our very initial uh, experiments, and here I want to just, I don't want to belabor anything about the QC. Um, it, was, it was relatively standard, except I get a lot of questions about its postmortem data, it, you know, the tissue is terrible, what was the RIN, all these kind of things. So I want to emphasize that we, we worked hard to introduce a number of randomization steps. We processed everything in a single site. We tried to do the best um, to come up, you know, sort of best practices for uh, this. The cases and controls are matched for ancestry. We were able to adjust for that always. Lots of other QC metrics around bias and clinical covariates. And at the end of the day, um, this is the hierarchical clustering of the 500 or so samples um, that, that made it all the way through. And if you, if you could see this slightly better, you'd see all the covariates at the top, um, and that while we're seeing distinctions uh, and clusters uh, between, uh, of overexpressed and underexpressed genes, none of them are really corresponding with these background covariates. So the first thing we wanted to do with this data, um, because it was, it was, you know, it's such an exciting um, EQTL resource was explore that a bit. Um, and we knew that that would allow us to ask questions very about uh, whether the GWAS signals were actually driving some of the gene expression that we were seeing. Um, and so here we have uh, 467 Caucasians. Um, uh, it, because the sample size is so so large, I think this is now probably around four or five times larger than the, the most recent GTEx release. We have, um, you know, 80% of the genes have uh, cis EQTLs at an FDR of 5%. They're found, you know, they're largely um, enriched in genic regions and depleted from in intergenic regions, and they're markedly enhanced in the brain tissues. And we've been able to um, uh, demonstrate, particularly with the, the GTEx data, that we find 95% of their EQTLs. We can't really ask the question in the rever reverse because of their sample size. Um, but the, the, this is now the largest data set, and it's, and it's available sh should anyone want to use it. It's already online. So the first question, can we identify a single time point in tissue um, instances where the disease-associated SNPs um, are convincingly associated with an expression change. And we used Sherlock. There, there's no perfect method for doing this. Um, this looks across uh, the genome and um, derives a Bayes factor for whether the associations and the expression signal uh, are uh, plausibly, uh, are, are more likely uh, causally related than not, and it sums those into a score. Um, this is the resulting plot across the genome. It's sparser than a traditional Manhattan plot for, say, for a GWAS because it's only the genes. Um, there were 84 genes in 30 regions that passed the threshold. There were some regions we wanted to be extremely strict um, with this, so we, we removed, uh, we did a number of other filtering steps, but at the end of the day, um, 20, about 20% 20 of the GWAS loci uh, had a significant relationship between the 
uh, risk SNP in the GWAS and the uh, EQTL signal. That meant the pattern of both looked identical. Usually, but not always, the index SNP being, uh, the, the being strongest both for the EQTL and for uh, the risk. And the five genes are here, furin, um, a, a preprotein convertase, that process is BDNF, and a, a number of other um, a uh, number of other important proteins, SNAP91 and T-snare, which are uh, involved in um, uh, uh, vesicle release, uh, uh, voltage-gated chloride channel, and contactin, a developmental molecule. So you say to me, so what? Is this functional? Is this relevant? I've done this you know, statistical test, statistical hair-waving. So the next thing we needed to figure out was, do we have a way to model this? So we sought something that was simple, that would allow us to screen a number of different um, uh, potential candidates. And so we uh, started working with Nikos, uh, Katsanis at Duke, and Zebrafish. And we used underexpression or overexpression um, as appropriately predicted by our gene expression to ask the question, what happened to head size? As just, not to model schizophrenia, just as a, to answer a gross question, if we change the levels, do they have something to do with the way the brain develops? Um, and what we found was that um, for three of the five cases, the for furin t snare and contactin, it led to decreased head size when we made, made the appropriate change. We also wondered, of course, whether this change in head size was associated with uh, differences in proliferation. And so the phosphohistone 3 staining primarily shows decreased proliferation. But of course, the, the second uh, uh, bar there, you can see, is increased proliferation. So that confused us. So we went on, um, or I should say Nikos' lab, went on to perform tunnel staining. And all of them show um, an higher apoptotic in index suggesting that um, the ultimate result is consistent with uh, a decreased head size. So um, because, because of these observations, we went on to ask about um, other early phenotypes, uh, this time switching and focusing on furin. Um, in iPS cells. This is a collaboration with Kristen Brennan. And so we asked the question, what happens when we make the same change in furin um, that, we, uh, that would be predicted by the direction of the alleles in our assay? And um, in three independent lines, she knocked down furin expression. And something's missing. Oh, OK. Um, and ask the question about radial migration out of a neurosphere. Um, and so following um, shRNA knockdown, you can see both uh, in the picture, but also then on the, in the graph on the right, that following knockdown, there's decreased migration. So all of these things are consistent um, and some evidence that we've identified genes in which the GWAS uh, SNP is associated with, specifically in that locus, uh, changing gene expression of a gene that's having some phenotypic, um, um, some phenotypic effects. So for me here, um, it, it's about, is this now worth studying much more extensively um, using CRISPR and making much more fine point, uh, uh, um, much more refined uh, uh, mutations that mimic what we observe more closely what we observe um, in patients and so that we can revert them and do those things. But it, it's critical to have some kind of um, evidence. We have good, strong genetic evidence that, that it's involved, good, strong expression evidence, but now, you know, now we have some phenotypic evidence. I'll come back to furin um, at the very end of the talk. Um, the other observation, uh, among other observations um, in this data set now, is that um, gene expression is subtly disrupted in schizophrenia, but really um, with very small effect sizes. So here, um, there were 
you know, almost 700 differentially expressed genes with about half being upregulated and half downregulated. But the average fold changes here are much smaller than what is usually considered acceptable in a gene expression study. And I would argue that this is largely because our sample size is much larger. Um, and so we are now seeing what is much more likely um, the real magnitude of the effects. We've done a lot of modeling. It's largely what you would predict from the kind of uh, allele frequency, the small allele frequency differences that are actually associated with the disease. Um, and from this, we estimate you know, something like 44% of the genes um, are differentially expressed between schizophrenia um, and controls. So um, this ca often causes quite a lot of dissension um, when I present this in, uh, to psychiatric genetics researchers because there's you know, 15 years of, of microarray studies in which there are very, you know, a handful of specific genes that people are interested in. We've now shown in an independent sample on microarrays um, that we see really just the same observation. We've just finished RNA sequencing these samples. I don't, I don't have the, uh, haven't analyzed the data yet, but I, I feel certain we'll see actually, you know, uh, it will corroborate what we've seen. So now moving on to then trying to understand at the network level and bring back to uh, the biology our system, we know that coordinated expression of genes um, is, is critical for uh, understanding the molecular pathway, uh, uh, molecular pathways in general, and, and is going to be critical for understanding the diversity of pathways that are likely going awry in schizophrenia. Um, we now, you know, we've known for a while that uh, transcriptional pathways are much more like the airplane hub kind of network that, I've show, that I'm showing on the right, in which there are a number of nodes um, many are not connected to much, and then there are some really critical central hub, uh, hub nodes that are connected to many different, uh, you know, uh, uh, many different cities. And that's in contrast to, of course, the, the roadmap that's on the left, which is, you know, really just roughly equivalent nodes and, um, and, and uh, highways that move through them. And so um, if we consider that the genes, we then reduce this to gene expression, that the genes are nodes in a network, um, weighted gene co-expression analysis that was developed originally by uh, uh, Steve Horvath's lab asks the question about whether you know, the edges that are connecting the nodes and the strength of the correlation, it assesses the strength of the correlation between each pair of genes um, and then arranges those into those groupings that are most uh, similar. Um, so in here, when we applied this to uh, the uh, gene expression in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we find that um, there are 35 modules. Each module has between 30 and 1900 genes. This is very typical for this kind of analysis. Um, four of the modules are rich for differentially expressed genes. They're, sh they're shown on um, the left. And when we ask uh, the question and we delve into these modules more fully, we find that only one of them, um, it's the, the lower of the modules, is enriched for uh, genes that are in GWAS loci, so they have common variants, um, genes that are found in copy number loci, as well as uh, rare single nucleotide variants. When we ask what cell types are these, um, the genes in this module predominantly, it, uh, it's identifying a neuronal module. And if we ask what uh, general categories they, these genes are in, they're in things like axon, the, you know, the, the uh, terms that come up are things like axon pathway, um, chemical signaling, um, uh, potassium channels. And in fact, if we dig a little bit more deeply into some of the pathways and grouping, smaller groupings of genes that have been implicated in the copy number variants um, and the rare de novo variants, such as things that are in the synapse, ARC, um, NMDA, postsynaptic density proteins, um, and FMRP targets, those are also enriched. Um, now, 
the problem, one of many problems with this kind of analysis is, is that this module is, is quite large. And so it's hard to know how to dig more deeply into this. Where do we go from here? So uh, Bin Zhang um, at, um, at Sinai has recently developed, and, and there are other enhancements of this too, but this is the one we've, we've used at the moment, um, um, uh, of uh, co-expression network analysis that's called multi-scale embedded gene co-expression network analysis. Briefly, this is, is an analysis that focuses on using a topological sphere. So one is projecting the network on in three dimensions rather than two dimensions, and that decreases some of the, it, it, it has favorable signal to noise property properties. Then it's um, these networks are um, filtered using um, uh, planar maximally filtered graphs. And uh, iteratively, one is removing connections that are not critical um, to wind up, to essentially to sparsify, to wind up with a, a much sparser network. And then that's um, uh, annotated with it, or and evaluated based on some other uh, information, either about gene expression or uh, GWAS variants or, or, or various other things. Um, and so, Applying this then to the same data that I, I've been talking about before, um, the analysis identifies four clusters. So these are all the clusters in a, in a very reduced form. I'll show you the fuller network um, on the next slide. <clears throat> Those that are in red are most relevant for uh, schizophrenia. Um, I've en enlarged them below here. And what we see is that those modules um, when we look, are significantly enriched for markers related to pyramidal neurons, glutamatergic neurotransmission. Um, they are all nested and related to each other. Um, and that the, um, so the, and the size of the modules is shown in, um, uh, in the parentheses. So um, I'm going to focus on this uh, module 131, because we find that the uh, hub genes of this module are much more likely to be differentially expressed. So what's shown is where this um, subnetwork fits in terms of the larger network. And on the left are the um, hubs uh, and the nodes are shown. And those that are uh, downregulated are in green and upregulated are uh, in um, red. And these are enriched uh, over uh, other subnetworks. What we found when we looked a little bit more closely was that furin sits in this um, network, but is not itself a hub. Um, but it is connected uh, to uh, only four genes, two of which are themselves hubs. And so you can see on the bottom left, or, or the bottom graph, that uh, furin is much less it's connected itself than other genes in this network. Um, but its second degree connections are much larger. So it's in a position to influence many, many genes. And for me, this is really what I'm looking for. I now have um, a predictions that I can make around um, what I should observe if I up or down regulate furin um, and to, to begin that process of understanding what is the larger network that's really specifically influenced by furin. Um, so, and then I think the next slide is, is maybe my last slide, which is that, um, and I'm not going to show you any data above this, but all of this data now needs to be and can be refined with increasing information around uh, the functional elements in the genome. So here, this is uh, some recent ChIP-seq data we have on, um, there's just a couple of marks that I'm showing um, in two brain regions. All of this data now that we're collecting is from fact-sorted material, and so we're looking at both neuronal nuclei as well as um, non-neuronal nuclei, and we can see um, you can see it either uh, on the left, but it's probably easier in the PCA plot on the right, that there, while there's not much differentiation between specific regions, um, the differences between the uh, new N positive or the neuronal fraction and the new N negative fraction, um, as well as between the promoter mark and the, and the enhancer mark are uh, uh, 
quite profound. We are, we've just about finished collecting uh, data that will allow us to very carefully investigate inter-individual differences, which isn't possible in the roadmap or ENCODE project where um, you know, a very small number of samples are, are looked at, as well as ask questions about differences between the, the cases and controls. And so, um, in conclusion, um, the common mind is really a resource that should be useful broadly for uh, individuals studying uh, 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 brain diseases. Um, the EQTL analysis have provided a number of functional clues that we can follow up in a, in a variety of uh, straightforward ways. Um, and that the network analyses further elucidate pathways that will allow us to develop uh, testable hypotheses. So the Common Mind Consortium members um, are listed here. I, you know, I, none of this could be done without lots of collection that was, uh, uh, took place over the years, as well as um, our various both uh, pharma and um, other partners. And then the data analyses themselves that I talked about were um, uh, performed by um, a number of talented individuals, Panos Russos, who's a, a young assistant professor, Menachem Fromer, um, whom I've just lost, unfortunately, to Verily, um, and uh, Davy Kavanaugh, um, and then uh, you know the rest of the uh, the rest of the uh, colleagues are uh, on the slide. So, questions? When, when you're seeing differential changes in expression, can you give us an idea of like what scale the changes in expression happen to be? You know, what you were saying is that you know these these are SNPs that are causing changes in expression across multiple genes, right? right? And like, so what what's the scale? You know, when you do say an shRNA experiment to knock everything all the way down, right? W what's the underlying biology in the human? Like, are we talking five percent differences, fifty percent? Small, much smaller. You know, so ten percent differences, right, in the human. So, so it's 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 overkill these first experiments, right? Question back there. Oh, yeah, quick question in your GWAS. Why did you exclude the uh, trans EQTL in your filter? In your GWAS of the variance, yes. when you filtered, why did you exclude the trans EQTLs? Oh, so um, because, um, because trans EQTLs are much more difficult to convince oneself that, that they're real. Um, and, uh, and the, and while we were conser very conservative, uh, I mean, we wanted to be quite conservative, basically. Um, there's only one gene that was supported by only trans EQTL. It really made very little, because we were so conservative in the trans EQTL, so we fed into the algorithm, it didn't make that much difference. Uh, 